I'm Jenny Brockie. Tonight on Insight, a room of champions talk about life after sport. Yeah, it felt like I was put out to pasture. <laughs> My plan B and C and D was all the same. It was plan A, playing in the Winfield Cup. For some reason I can't let go because that elusive gold medal never happened. I'm not qualified of anything to earn money. Your promising AFL career was cut short last year. I wish I was able to go out there and like, run around and play sport with the boys. Lauren, you're regarded as one of the greatest women basketballers of all time. You dominated Australian and American basketball courts for almost 20 years. How did you react initially when you retired? Um, it, was, it was really difficult. Uh, I was pushed out because of injury, obviously, and um, I, I personally wasn't ready to retire. It was one of those things where I just I couldn't run anymore and, and I wasn't, there was no way I was going to get back out onto a court. So a group of doctors sat me down and said, you're never going to play again, it's over. And that was it. And I just remember thinking, OK. So I got up out of the room and, uh, yeah, I broke down and it was hard. I mean, it was really, really difficult. Were you prepared at all? Was there any sense that that might be coming or did it really yeah. blindside you? Well, two, three years ago now, actually, I was in China and I, I sort of messed my knee up a little bit and I had about 15 operations um, in the space of two years and then uh, after... The last injury was ACL, I tore my ACL, had that repaired in the hope of getting back for Rio. And then six weeks later, I got an infection in my knee joint and then I, I had to have a knee replacement. And then, yeah, when it was over, it was over. And I actually needed them to tell me it was over. I couldn't obviously face You couldn't make that decision yeah. yourself. Tell me a bit more about how you reacted. Um, initially, uh, there was this tiny little bit of relief when I was sitting in the room with everybody um, because, I, you know, in my heart, I think I knew it was over. But like I said, I could not actually make that decision myself. Um, I had to be told. And, and then within five minutes, I was bawling. I was crying. Um, I went straight back to my parents' house. Um, my parents have been my biggest supporters. And throughout my career, um, I found that they're really the only people in the world that I can trust. So I went back to my Is that right? Career. That's how you feel? They're oh, the only ones? Yep. You, can, mm. you can't rely on anyone. Um, and for me, you know, my parents have just been that, that rock. And without them, um, I don't know if I would have, you know, got to the heights that I did in my career. How long did that sense of devastation last for you? Oh, couple of months until I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> I moved on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a lot to cover in one, in one answer. Um, so that's the secret. Yeah, yeah that's right. You all get pregnant. Excellent. Oh. Good luck with that, Matthew. Yeah. Um, just, you're gliding over this a little bit, though. I mean, two months is a long time. What was going on during that time? I, I did go into a shell. Um, I stayed with my parents. I didn't leave the house. Um, and they really just took care of me. Um, and, yeah, like, I, I don't really want to go into great detail about mm. how hard it was because it was really, really difficult. Um, and without them, I, you know, I hate to think what would have happened. What about you, Barry Hall? You were one of the best forwards in the AFL. You played almost 300 games. How did you react when it was all over six years ago? Well, I, I had a different circumstance. I, I chose to retire. I wanted to retire. Um, I got the feeling that when I went to training every day that I didn't want to train anymore. I didn't want to prepare uh, to the best of my ability to, you know, perform on the weekend. I think when you get to that stage, that's when it's time to give up the game. Did I struggle after the sport finished? Absolutely. How? I certainly did. Um, just getting out of bed. Nothing to get out of bed for anymore. Mm. Yeah. It was a real struggle. You, you're all agreeing with yeah. this, yeah? Because yeah? <laughs> um, I'm a very driven person. Um, so, I'd, so what did you do? What, what? Well, I had two or three months, pretty much a similar amount of time as, as Lauren, that uh, I really struggled. I didn't get out of bed. I didn't answer mates' phone calls. Mm. I was eating terribly. I was drinking heavily. Um, it was a tough time. And, and look, I, I didn't know it at that stage, but that was a form of depression. I didn't know anything about it because... Um, you know, we're big, tough, burly men who yes. don't get depressed. Hang on, what are you talking about? Mm. Um, so, and, and that's why I was um, steadfast in coming on this show, because I think it's a real issue in sport. 
Um, so one thing I did do was start to set little goals for myself. Um, I'd go to the gym, I'd get up at 8, eight o'clock every morning and I'd try and get PBs in a bench press or a lap pull down or something like that, just a little goal yeah. to get me out of bed. And that's, that's where it started. Because now. that was what you were trained to do. I think Absolutely. that's interesting because as athletes, we are so often told we have our routine set. And then when you get into retirement, you get into the real world and it's mm. like you have to make your own routine. Mm. And I, I, that's something that was so foreign to me. Yeah. In my mm, well, Libby, it's interesting because, I mean, you were a four-time Olympic gold medalist, former world record holder, world champion many times over. Um, your Miss Sunshine on the surface, mm. what, <laughs> what, that smile, yeah. what, what was it like for you when it was over? Um, well, I had both experiences. I chose to retire um, in 2009 um, from swimming. And um, in that first retirement, it was very similar. Um, I, I definitely fell into depression. Um, when you're training 35 hours a week, you can eat a, a lot of food. Um, and when you're not training 35 hours a week, I continue to eat as though I was training at that Olympic level. Um, I, I put on a lot of weight. Um, I had no routine, stopped all forms of exercise. Um, stopped wanting to, to catch up with friends and family. Because what do you talk about now? You know, how, See, that's really interesting. How, you're saying, I didn't trust now. anyone but mum and dad. Barry, you're not taking friends' phone calls. Yeah. And Libby, you're saying the same. Why was that... Why, why does that happen? Oh, I do, think... Do you, well, do you feel you don't connect with people anymore? Or well, is it that you want I to had nothing outside of swimming, really. Yeah. You know, yep. I, um, I... I tried to create um, something outside of swimming. So I was doing university, um, but it wasn't necessarily a passion. And you say you didn't know what to talk to people about. Yeah. What it, what, I didn't know what was happening in my day that I could talk to people about. It's funny, I actually used it to see who would keep trying to call me and who oh, was right. actually in my circle. Ah, uh, so it was, oh, that's interesting. Because so it was a test. I finished and, yes, yeah. we always talk about footy and, you know, they loved uh, being around my career, but I actually used it a little bit against them wow. and who would stick around. So As a litmus test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why, yeah. why did you do that, Barry? Do you I'm not think? sure. Well, it's the, the trust thing and, and look, I've, I've been through a few things in my career where um, I trusted people and they've just dropped off because yeah. things haven't gone my way and it looked like I'd fall off the face of the earth, but I eventually fought back and come back and these people try to crawl back in your life. I, mm. I don't like that. No. So did you feel that people were only interested because of your career, oh, in a sense? Well, I think when you're a really elite athlete, um, there's a lot to gain from having you. Um, like whether you're a coach, you're an uh, administrator, whatever, you need to get the best out of your athletes. And when you're not getting the best out of your athletes, then you move on. And I think for me, after when I retired, it's really interesting. I felt like I was put out to pasture, mm -hmm. <laughs> literally. Like it was, I, I'd been one of their greatest resources and, you know, um, athletes and whatever. And then all of a sudden it was over <laughs> and you, you don't hear from them. But, you know, meanwhile, my body's crap, crap. Sorry, you know, I don't know. That's okay. On TV. You just did. We just beeped it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said something else. Um, yeah, no, it, and yeah, the whole depression thing, um, trying to get off, like I, I was on um, antidepressants during my career, so getting off all of that stuff, I just didn't have that support. Where you think, you know, you've, you've spent so much time doing this one thing your whole life, and then all of a sudden, it's over, you know, mm. and you don't. Do, have were you on antidepressants all of your career, not because of the pressures of the career, or do you think no. that might have been the case anyway? No, I, I think that you know I definitely had my own demons throughout my career, and I had to deal with that, and I would have had them regardless of whether I was an athlete or not. But you know, I think um, a lot of that stuff has subsided for me now, thank God. But it's you know, I'm glad that I retired because I feel like a a more whole person now that I've found myself, you know, mm. away from what defined me as a human being for so long. Mm. Matthew, you won gold in the diving at the Beijing Olympics in 2008 when you were 20. Did you ever wonder what life would be like for you when that was all over? Um, 
No, and I think that's part of the problem. I remember as an eight-year-old having this really um, powerful thought that I just wanted to be the best in the world at something, and I didn't care what it was. I hadn't even started sport yet, but I thought, yeah, I, if I'm the best in the world at something, then like everyone's going to love me. And um, and when sport came into my life, um, you know, I just grabbed it with both reins and with both hands and just just went with it, um, possibly to the detriment of you know all the other areas of my life. You know, I just put all of my eggs in one basket with mm -hmm. diving, um, which means that, uh, and because I was so um, focused, like with the blinkers on, of achieving that one goal, I didn't dare to, 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 to create a plan B. I didn't even want to entertain the thought that I might not be the best in the world at something. Mm. And so then when it did happen, I was just kind of left with like, well, what now? I haven't prepared for this. Mm. Did you ever think you might be at risk? Um, yeah, uh, yes, because um, I suffered from a pretty profound period of depression from 14 to 18. Um, and um, because of the nature of sport, well, also because of my own faulty beliefs around my mental health, um, I didn't want to tell anybody about it because I saw it as a, a weakness. Well, I didn't want anybody else to see that I had yeah. a weakness and exploit that. Um, so I. I just tried to manage it myself, which ended up um, resulting in me retiring at 18 and going a bit off the rails um, with, uh, with drugs and partying and stuff. And I, when I retired at 18, I actually had no intention of ever returning to the sport. Um, but it wasn't until uh, a wonderful man called Chava Sabrino, who is the diving coach at the New South Wales Institute of Sport, he actually um, said, look, if you ever want to start diving again, I'll always have a place in my squad for you. Um, and that was enough for me to reconsider my um, retirement, um, move cities and, and start diving again just 15 months before Beijing. Mm. So what was it like then when you did give up? So I never actually addressed any of the underlying causes of my depression. And so after Beijing happened, which was amazing, yay. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> all of us, like, after a while, the, the self-esteem stuff started to kick back in again, and I started to believe that, um, that nobody actually liked me. They just liked the medal, and that I was just a, a coat rack for the medal, and that I had no value as a person. Mm. And that's when I had a, a relapse of, um, of my drug addiction. Mm. Yana, wh what about you? You, um had a couple of goes at retirement. How did you cope with it? Well, it's, I don't even know if I've really retired yet, to be honest. I think, whereas these guys have had a bit, a bit differently. It's funny, listening to how you talk, I'm not really sure I've actually coped with it yet. I know I was talking prior to this interview with my family about what I'd want to say um, about athlete retirement, but I've actually teared up quite a few times just hearing what you guys say. So I think I'm probably in the midst of my retirement at the moment and feeling, and I'm getting very fat right now <laughs> with the you amount of food I have. You yeah. just had a baby, yeah. I have just had a baby, but I, I, I feel like I can't stop eating, which is a funny thing, and I haven't yep. turned off my athlete. Yeah. <laughs> I you should training. talk to Libby yeah, later. Yeah. We'll go, we'll yeah. go yeah. after yeah. the show. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever dealt with. And for me, whereas these guys have obviously succeeded. I did never hit the goal that I was hoping for in my career. So growing up as a child, wanting to win the Olympic Games is all I've ever dreamed of. So I guess I'm going to get teary. It's funny. I thought I was ready for this, but I don't know if I am. <laughs> um, I never made it. So for that. But you were a world champion. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's not what I wanted. Yeah. Okay. So, so that sense that you never quite got there does that mean you've never quite retired, in a way? Is that, are they connected? Yeah, because, I mean, I've got a beautiful family. I've got three beautiful kids. I'm studying to be a doctor. <laughs> like, I've got so many things on. I can't fit training in, in anymore. But kind of like Barry, I, I'm not interested in being there. But for some reason, I can't let go because that elusive gold medal never happened. Mm -hmm. So my poor family, every minute, every minute I'm, I'm, I'm retired, I'm done, I'm done. And then five minutes, like, no, no, I'm back at the gym. Mum, can you come <laughs> up after the kids? It's yeah, well, you went from <laughs> the hurdling to the bobsleigh as well, didn't you? To, yeah. To... And, and I thought were... that was going to be it because it was such a wonderful transition to go out of a sport where you were supposed to win the Olympics and to go into something where, one, you're part of a team, so that's amazing. Um, and secondly, you know, it's a, it's a different sport where you're not expected to win. Like, it was just about, you know, the Aussies going out for, like, I mean, let's be real, bobsled in Australia, it's not really the, <laughs> not really the big thing. So um, it was really amazing to, to have that opportunity and I thought that was it. But yet again, um, straight after the Olympics, I'm fit and I'm uninjured. And then to be injury-free, you think, 
sweet, it's two years till Rio, give it a go. Mm. And then right now in the back of my head, it's like, sweet, it's three years till Tokyo. We'll give so it you're, go. Still thinking, <laughs> <laughs> you're still thinking about Tokyo? I can't help it. That's what I, I need an off switch. And that's where I haven't had what I would love a set, a set of doctors to sit me down and say, you are done. Like, I'm, I am going to be a doctor and I still can't tell myself I'm done. Like, it's, <laughs> Why do you think it's so hard for you? As I said, I think it's that I haven't won that elusive medal that I you know, put on my wall for so long. Um, Why is that medals, I mean, I mean obviously a, an Olympic medal is hugely important, but why have you not been able to let go of that idea? Identity, I think. It's that you have caught yourself up so much in what you want and believe is, 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 is who you are and to sort of not... I think actually for me it was also a little bit, and this is a great message for the young audience in our room, is I made a lot of mistakes with the media. Again, a little bit like Matt. I was so desperate to be liked, so I grew up as a real nerdy kid hanging out in the library and not really having a great social network. And I saw sport as a platform to me to make friends and to be popular and, and, and no one in their right mind would want the media to, make, to say negative things about them. Like, mm. let's be honest honest. None of us stand up and go, hey, I want to be hated by the public. <laughs> it's just not something we do. But I thought by talking and being really honest as a young kid, so I'm talking 19, 20 years of age, that the more I spoke, the more people would understand and like you. And it sort of backfired. So I think a part of my lack of retirement and issues with it was trying to prove to other people that I am actually a good athlete. I am actually worth who I am. And, and it took a long time probably probably getting into medical school before I realised that actually I'm okay just to, as I am and that the people that matter are the people like Lauren who, who are your family. You can really trust the people behind you who've been there from day one before you were famous, before anything mattered. When you see athletes like Grant Hackett and Ben Cousins with the struggles that they're having at the moment, what's your reaction? As, as elite athletes? I, well, for, for me personally, I think it's incredibly sad. I mean, there's no other real way to, to observe or describe it, especially most recently with someone like Grant. You see his family are in the media and you can see how destructive mental illness and potential addiction things can be, not just to the person who is suffering, but to the family unit. You said that you went through a period of depression as well. Having been in those kind of slumps, you know, what, what reaction do you have personally when you see people on the edge like that? Do you feel a long way from that or can you imagine that you could have gone oh, down no. those paths? It, very easily you can go down those paths, I think. Yeah. What do the rest of you think? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. It's frightening to watch it because, yeah, you can identify a little bit with it. And for me, I, I know quite easily quite easily I could have fallen in that same trap. My self-worth ended up being reflected back to me in the judges' score. If I got a 9, they really liked me. To, if I got a 10, I was perfect. My grandfather played over 100 games, 54 premiership with the Bulldogs. My old man played uh, 100 games more with Collingwood, Richmond and, and the Bulldogs. I just wanted to impress Dad. <laughs> yeah, I did. being a basketball champion first figure in your thinking well apparently I was about two years old um, my parents both represented Australia and my mum the story is she had me um, naturally and two weeks later was back on a basketball court she was a captain of the Australian team and um, yeah so apparently I that's what I'd said to my <laughs> aunt. <laughs> no, she's amazing. I was a 10 pound baby too. So she's old. I know. Wow. Yeah, she deserves congratulations. Um, Did anyway. you ever see yourself as anything else? Never, never. I always. What, from the age was... of two? You never thought, oh, I might do this or I might be no, that? Or... I mean, well, I remember when I was four saying, telling people I was going to play in the NBA. You know, I, and mum and dad never said, no, that's for men. You know, it was never anything like you that. You fully intended to play basketball with the men? Oh, yeah. I thought I could then when I was four. Like, I actually had this, like, similar to what you were saying about wanting to be the best in the world, I, I was like that too with basketball. I had no other direction. So yeah, it was in me, for sure. Mm. Um, Matthew, what did you want as a kid? Um, I think the motive, like, the trigger for this thought that I just wanted to be the best in the world at something was that I felt... Um, maybe a bit like neglected or that I wasn't getting the positive reinforcement and the validation that I was craving and, um, and this was then, at home with, yeah. with your mum? Yes um, I mean the, she was sick at the time anyway and it was a single parent like single child single parent in a house by ourselves you know and she had chronic fatigue and stuff and so she spent a lot of time like a lot of time um, in bed and so I was by myself a lot 
and so not getting any of that, that validation that I was craving. And then when I did actually do something great, that only acted as, as confirmation mm -hmm. to this belief that if I did really great things, I was going to get this, this validation, this positive reinforcement. And then so, you know, my mind just went straight to, yeah, if I'm the best in the world, everyone's going to love me. Mum's going to love me. Everyone's going to love me. And that acted as a really, really powerful emotional motivator right throughout my teenage years and like I still stayed in diving even though I was um, not enjoying it um, I stuck with it because I felt like this was my one ticket to being special. Wow those, those are really high stakes then mm. particularly if you're operating at that level when you end when mm. it when it's over. You know my self-worth ended up being reflected back to me in the judges scores if I got an eight they liked me if I got a nine they really liked me and if I got a ten I was perfect mm. my whole self-esteem was based on these numbers that I was getting from the judges or the feedback that I was getting from my coach or you know how many Twitter and Facebook followers I had like all of these external sources that are all really quite fragile you were measuring all the time how, how yeah how much you were worth yeah mm. how much of your self-worth was tied up with basketball do you think Lauren um, I, don't, I don't think I don't, I don't think I've ever had a problem so much with self-esteem. Like, I, I had so much confidence in basketball. Like, by the time I was in Year 7, I was telling people at school that by Year 10, I'm going to be at the AIS and playing basketball, and I was. And, I, and for me, it wasn't so much about that. It was the highs and lows that I really struggled with in life. Like, I was either very high or very low, and it's just a, a chemical thing for me, um, what I was dealing with. So... You know, with basketball, the minute I got out on the basketball court, I could just forget about everything else that was going on in my life and just play. And that's sort of how I threw myself into sport and how I became um, the player that I was because I just left it all out there. You mm. know. Jake, you played AFL briefly for Carlton. You could have chosen a cricket career, which you were also really good at. Why mm. AFL? What, what drove you towards AFL? Yeah, I guess I've got a bit of a family history uh, in AFL, VFL football. Um, so growing up my entire life, grew up on a small farm uh, down, in, down in Victoria. Um, my great-grandfather played over 100 games for the Foot, Footscray and the Bulldogs. My grandfather played over 100 games with 54 Premiership with the Bulldogs. My old man played uh, 100 games more with Collingwood, Richmond and, and the Bulldogs. And my cousin Shane O'Bree played 200, nearly 250 games of AFL. Uh, football. So I remember a conversation I had with my, my old man one day and he came into my into my bedroom and he goes, look, mum, can't keep driving you around to cricket and football the whole time. So you've got to make your mind up. Because I've just been selected for Vic in cricket uh, and, and football as well. And he goes, make up your mind. We'll leave it up to you. Whatever you want to do, you know, it will, it, it's your choice. It's your life. And he turned around, went to walk out and he stopped and he goes, but you know the family history in football, don't you? <laughs> um, so it, obviously in that moment, I remember thinking, look, I was always going to play AFL football. What were you hoping to achieve as an AFL player? Uh, 100 games, AFL. Because to me, anything below that was a fail. And once you made it to Carlton, what was it like with all that history behind you, waiting to see if you get picked or not? Yeah, it was a, a, big, a big moment in time. I certainly remember it um, as clear as uh, today. So, you know, I, I had the expectation of getting drafted. I was a 17-year-old, uh, so I was a bottom age recruit. Uh, so, you know, I just finished year 12 and then got drafted to the Carlton Football Club. Um, and for me, it was such an exciting period. How much of your self-worth do you think was tied up with being an AFL player? Um, you know, I see so many young faces in this room and, you know, uh, when I was in year 12, so probably roughly some people in this room would be around that age bracket, I didn't have athletes like this as role models that were actually real and honest and raw about... The, the realism of becoming an athlete. Uh, all I saw was, you know, the, the highlights of playing mm -hmm. AFL football. Uh, but, yeah, look, it, certainly the transition period was quite, quite difficult mm. for me. Uh, PJ Marsh, what about you? Um, you grew up in Blackwater in central Queensland. Did you always want to play in the NRL? Yeah, since Lauren started talking here before, I've just been nodding about every single <laughs> thing that each person has said at every stage of their career when they finished. I was eight years old when I decided I was going to play in the NRL. Back then it was the Winfield Cup. We put a time capsule in the ground in, I think it was year three. Yeah, I was turning, turning nine and it said, the class teacher said to us, you need to write on the bit of paper what you'll be doing in the year 2000. 
and I rode on it, I'll be playing for the Brisbane Broncos in the Winfield Cup, or I'll be mowing the lawn so I can watch the football for free. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it seemed like a foolproof plan. In 2000, my mum and dad rang me from school with all my relatives laughing. I was an um, apprentice greenskeeper at Parramatta Stadium, and I'd played about oh, a handful of first-grade games with the Parramatta Eels. So. I know when earlier they were talking about um, what they wanted to do, goals and all the rest of it, and plan A, plan B. My plan B and C and D was all the same. It was plan A, play yeah. in, in the Winfield Cup. You know, your plan A for every young person here should be to be a millionaire, to be a sports person, play in the NRL. It should be that, but just be working on your plan B mm. all the time. And I think that that's a real... Real important thing. So, what was it like when you were asked to join the Parramatta Eels? Yeah, dream come true. You know, when I first cracked it with Parramatta Eels, I looked around at all these more talented people than me, and I thought, what am I? What have I got to do to catch those guys? There and then, I quit drinking. I never drank a drop of alcohol, alcohol for ten years. I started training whenever my mates went out, and. It's, it's hard to describe that feeling. I'm not sure whether they were getting that same feeling or whenever people you know, head out and party, if they're getting that same feeling. But when I ran onto that field, it was amazing. Mm. And, I, you, and I remember it. You yeah. played uh, more than 150 games for the NRL and four State of Origins. How much of your identity got tied up in being in the NRL? Yeah, that was some of the nodding I was talking when Barry said about the friends, because PJ Marsh, the NRL player, that, that's what I was to my mates. I played in the NRL, so every time I went back home, it was like they kept, you know, they always wanted to know about football. We'd talk about football. What's it like? Now, I, you know, I don't go out a lot because it's, I'm, you know, talking to my mates. What am I going to talk to them about? That's what Libby said. Exactly. Like, yeah. I can't tell them about what we're doing at the Brisbane Broncos at the moment or what we're doing at the Warriors because I'm not there anymore. I think, I think just on that, um, you know, you're all wearing polos and that now. One thing that I attached myself to was I lived through that jumper. And as you're saying, PJ, like, if, I don't, if I'm not wearing that jumper, what value do I bring to people's lives? And I think moving forward, yes, you want to become an athlete and you want to achieve great things, don't get me wrong, and it's terrific, but you're so much more than that polo you're wearing right now. Because if I had known that back before I started playing, um, I sure as hell as don't think I would have went down the path I would have went down. Who'd like to ask a question of some of the people here? Do you think it's the sporting culture though? Because we're all drilled into like training eight sessions a week because I'm a swimmer myself. Like swim eight sessions a week, you've got to go to the gym. Like then once you quit, you're like, well, then there's nothing there. Do you think... I would... You're a swimmer? Yes. Courtney, a marathon swimmer? Yes, yes. yes. Mm. Oh. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Ruby. No pressure. Um, I, yeah, I think it is partly the culture because I think we are all so laser focused yeah. on what the goal is. And, you know, for me, that involved an Olympic gold medal and, um, you know, personal best times and yeah, all yeah. those elements. Did you know it was time to retire? Like I, I, I got injured. So okay. I had had a year out with my first retirement. Um, came back, managed to make London yep. um, and had every intention of going on to Rio, but I had a full um, wrist tear in, and it required a wrist reconstruction. And I just knew that amount of time at that age was not going to allow me to get back to where I wanted to be. Um, what are you most interested in, Courtney, as somebody who's, because you're aiming for World champs. World champs, yep. yeah. So what are you most interested in when you hear these stories well, like, about retirement? I've been through the depression stage, not recently, like back when I was younger, like moving towns, like moving from a city area in Campbelltown, like Sydney, and then moving to like a country regional area in Orange, which has no swimmers my age, mm. which I'm the oldest by five years. So trying to get that push and drive, but it's just knowing when time's up to quit the comps, like it's... And, and it... I don't think you can know until you're there. Yeah. And then even if you do make that decision, sometimes you can come back and that's fine <laughs> too. Um, but I, I, like, I still miss it. Like, I still, yeah. swimming is still such a huge part of who I am. It's, it's given me basically everything yeah. in my life, including a husband and a baby. Um, 
Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, <thanks. laughs> um, but well, you joined your first swimming club when you were four, yeah? Yeah, mm. yeah. I learned to swim when I was one. I grew up in Townsville, so you just had to learn to swim up there. And did you ever set your sights anywhere else? Or, or was it always just all swimming? I, to be honest, I, I never, I wasn't like um, Matt or, or Lauren. I, I didn't know that I wanted to be on, on the Olympic team, on the Australian swimming team, until I was probably um, a bit further down the path. I knew that I was <laughs> very competitive. Um, like I would ask, I remember maybe I was three or four, and I would ask my mum to count how long it would take me to run from her to a tree and back. Mm -hmm. And then I'd do it again to try and go faster. Um, <laughs> so I had that competitiveness from... Barry, a, Barry's liking this. <laughs> yeah. From the very beginning. Like, I think that's part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. um, There's a full arrival of Libby's, I can attest. That <laughs> 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 Including Nintendo. No, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes, very intense. Mel, you're an Olympic gold medalist as well. Did you have the laser focus? Probably not, to be honest. Um, maybe to my detriment of the level that I achieved. Um, obviously, winning an Olympic relay medal is fantastic, but in swimming, it's an individual sport. The pinnacle is individual. Um, so for me, I always wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist, but for me also, a relay was just as good as an individual. I, I wanted to win an individual medal, but I never had that like need and such focus that I just it had to be that or nothing. Mm. So what's so. that meant for your retirement? Um, I, I've probably handled it quite well, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been said tonight that I actually don't relate to at all. Mm. Um, and probably if I could pick out the things that stick out to me is that a lot of people here have started their sports so young, whereas I started a lot later. Um, I also had the desire and the passion to be a doctor before I ever wanted to go to the Olympics. Yeah. Yana, did you always want to be a hurdler? I've always wanted to be a doctor as well, which is why I always found it really interesting why I've struggled with retirement so much, because medical school, like I was that kid that carried, a, like you guys all talk about when you're in your, you know, in your childhood talking about sport, I, was, I carried a doctor's bag around and administered medication to all my brothers and sisters. <laughs> so I was like, so I'm not really sure why it, was such, why it still is such a big thing for me. Um, but what I have noticed is I now have highs in medicine. So instead of just being P's, get degrees, get, be a doctor, I'm obsessed with getting HD's. And it means it's very, I've got to somehow learn in every part of your life. You've got to be top of the tree. To, how to moderate. Yeah, I've got to start, I've got to start moderate. I'm learning that from mm. even listening to you guys. So I'm learning as much as these young people <laughs> mm -hmm. that I need to moderate that behaviour. So I don't want people at home or in the audience to be scared to think that sport is something you don't want to try. It's yeah, been yeah. the most amazing thing I've ever done mm. in my life. Totally. It's incredible to be up there representing your country, wearing the green and gold, hearing your anthem play and the Aussie flag rising above everybody else's. It's incredible. But you've just got to be prepared that most of us aren't like Barry. We don't get a choice. And you just have to have a little bit of a backup plan. Mm. And Barry, you started out as a boxer. Mm -hmm. Why? I just wanted to impress Dad. <laughs> yeah, I did. I just wanted to impress my dad like, like most young kids. Uh, he was a boxer. Uh, so, you know, from the age of six or seven, we had a punching bag out in the garage and I used to just go and punch it. And he'd be working on his cars or whatever and I'd only punch him when he's watching, you know, try and show off in front of him. <laughs> uh, it was just one of those things I just wanted to impress my dad. I didn't really want to do it, to be honest. It's a hard sport, really hard sport. So how did you move to AFL? Well, I, I lost my last fight and I actually used that as an excuse to get out of boxing. And my dad was so disappointed because there was um, Olympic, Olympic Games coming up. And because I was a state title holder, we would go to nationals and you could qualify for the Olympic Games. So, How did Dad react? Didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Is that all? Like, did, you didn't talk for quite a while? No, yeah, we, yeah, it was quite a few issues. What sort of advice had your Dad given you growing up? What kind of things did he say about what sort of life advice? Um, look, my Dad's a really hard man. Uh, he's probably, he hasn't got very good words of wisdom. But um, it was all what about, it was all ego driven and it was drummed into me at a young age to not let anyone have anything over you, um, always fight your way out of corners, all that sort of stuff mm. that um, it was just drummed into me at an early age. Um, when I could channel that in a right way, I could benefit from it, but on the other sense, 
um, it hindered me in, in a lot of ways as well. Mm. Well, the few years that led up to your retirement were really tricky for you, weren't they? And, and controversial. There were mm. violent incidents on the field. This one famously in 2008 where you um, punched West Coast Eagles player Brent Staker. Oh, well, he's let himself down completely there, Barry Hall. That is the sort of thing that we thought was out of his game. What's it like looking at that now? Yeah, I, I don't like it at all. What was, look, it's, going it's, on, what was going on for you when, you when you were doing that on the field? I was just an angry, frustrated man. Um, super competitive, like you know, Libby, we all spoke about being competitive. I was competitive to the point of being unhealthy, that I'd make it personal if someone beat me. I'd make it personal and I'd do anything to get them back. And do you yeah. think that was because of the way you'd been raised? Well, it was, it was pretty ruthless the way I was raised, yeah. Yep. In what way? Well, I'd, one day I came home with, uh, I got a cut on my cheek, I got beaten up at school and the instructions were to go back the next morning and fix it up. Mm. Don't come home unless you do. So it's just a, a pretty brutal way. Mm. And I didn't want to go back and fight the kid, but I felt like I had to. So, um, as I said, it's not something I'm proud of. Like I, look, I look at that and I'm, I'm disgusted in it because he has to live through that now, not only me. You were dropped by the Swans. Um, you went from being co-captain in the mid-2000s yeah. to being dropped in 2009. What was that like? It was hard, but I, I, one thing I've done now is you've got to accept responsibility for what you do. Did you think about retiring then? Yeah, I did, yeah. And what stopped you? Uh, I just thought I had more to offer the game and I didn't want to go out of the game as a disgraced player. So then I, th I started talking to the Western Bulldogs, talking to Rocket Ed, and he said, you just need to enjoy footy. Enjoy it for what it is. You've done all the hard work. You don't have to make it. You've made it. Enjoy it. And it just opened my eyes. I'd, I had a pre-season. I actually looked forward to coming back. Um, I was rejuvenated. I was like a, a different person, a different player. How did you know when it was time to go? Driving to training all the time. I didn't want to go. Mm. Yeah. PJ, what happens with serious injury? In your case, you had serious injury that pushed you out. Yeah, I, I remember earlier the different... So hearing Barry say he got the call it quits when he wanted. 23 is when I first broke my neck and was told I'd never play again and didn't play for two years and then came back to play. And then it, I obviously was never the same player again. I, I woke up one day and couldn't move and it was scary because the first thing you do when you've had neck injuries and back injuries and I woke up in my hands and and I couldn't move and every time I did go to move it hurt more and more and I was ready to play two days later and I was you know, so proud I was picked to play for the Aboriginal All-Stars side and in the first year it was uh, held and I was looking forward to it and then I literally got a needle so I could move, put in a car, driven back to Brisbane and I never ever played ever again. Mm -hmm. I never got to have that game where I said thank you to people and they maybe clapped me off or it was in the off season, I disappeared and I disappeared not just from football but I disappeared from everything for about three, nearly four years. I went way back out west where I grew up and, and I never talked football, never spoke about football. It's really interesting, it seems to be a common theme that, um, you know, that one day you're playing and you're competing and the next day it's over and how do you handle that? And I wonder, it sort of makes me think that that is an important part of it because, you know, in my own experience, I was injured as well, I had about a three year injury, eventually it got me and I was able to rehab it enough to swim one last time at the Olympic trials, knowing I would not make the team, but having that meet to be able to swim that last time and say goodbye to my like career. Like a farewell meet. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I guess for me I remember standing on the block and having that feeling like I did when I was a kid, that I was just out there having fun mm. and there was no pressure and it was just that farewell meet for me and I wonder if that is an important part of it, that when it does end so suddenly, if that just compounds the issue. One second I was a footballer, loving it. Mm. Um, and that was where I wanted to be, and the next second, bang, I was um, 
clue here. Justin, your promising AFL career with the Brisbane Lions was cut short last year with a serious concussion. What was it like for you giving up elite sport it was, so early in yeah, your career? That was probably the hardest part about it, was the fact that I knew that I had... I, I believe that I had, you know, six, eight years of good footy, mm. probably the peak of my career to come ahead of me. Um, and so... I guess that part of it was the hardest and has been the hardest part to deal with. It's something that I still struggle with. Um, like, I, I wish I was able to go out there and like, run around and play sport with the boys. Mm. You OK? Yeah. Yeah, re I mean, really difficult and, and so random, those things. They're, yeah. they're just so random, aren't they? They are, but... I guess I'm incredibly lucky in the respect that I have an, a, an identity other than football and I think that that's something that's incredibly important to develop outside of your sport is an identity. You do have an identity outside sport um, yeah. and, you, and you had a very clear plan about what to do as well which is what makes it interesting that you know it's still so devastating when something like that happens because what, tell everyone what you studied and what you're studying now. Yeah, look, growing up, I get I came from an incredibly different background to a lot of you in the respect that I played sport for fun right up until I was 18 um, and got drafted. I was incredibly fortunate to be plucked from relative obscurity um, in country footy to get picked up in the rookie draft and suddenly I'll. I'll I was working at a grain silo one day, just finished year 12, and next second I was up training with the Brisbane Lions, like, what the hell? <laughs> like, that just doesn't happen. I couldn't believe the circumstances that I was in. Um, and so I guess from that background, all through my younger years, I identified much more as an academic person. Um, I was, you know, not, to, uh, not the coolest kid at school. Um, I was a bit of a dork and, you know, wore black shoes when everybody else was wear, allowed to wear sneakers and stuff. <laughs> and so I loved the schooling and that was probably what I was best known for. Like, I played sport and I was pretty good at it. So suddenly I was plucked um, and shoved into a football environment where it was, holy moly, like, this is what all the kids dream about. They dream about growing up and being like Barry Hall and, you know, the, like Dan Merritt and all, John Brown, all of those superstars that you think about and you want to be like. Um, whereas for me, I'd sort of grown up, I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer, design planes and fly them and love that sort of stuff. So suddenly I was almost inserted into someone else's dream. It was a dream that I'd always had, but I never really bothered to fantasise about because it was so... Did, it change, did that change your sense of your identity? Uh, a little bit, but I always wanted to be known as Justin the person. But <clears throat> I think that the identity of becoming a footballer certainly was developed um, uh, very quickly because I was, had to adjust to that professional environment. How long did you play for? Uh, five years. Mm. Um, so I managed to play 56 games um, and it was January last year, it was just a stock standard training session. I woke up, you know, went to training and look, it, it, the play could run a million times and I would have been fine. Um, and so it's just one of those things that is pretty raw um, that is just a fluke accident. Mm. And it just completely changes your life. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. One second I was a footballer, loving it. Mm. Um, and that was where I wanted to be. And the next second, mm. bang, I was um, completely out. So how have you managed then in the time since you've been out? It's been an interesting transition. Um, I'm probably really fortunate in the respect that I can't remember much of the transition. Um, with the memory sort of loss that I've had around that time, it's sort of a bit blurry, which is probably a great thing that I can't remember where I was you know, mm. in those periods. Are you still studying? Yeah, so um, basically the, the call on my career was dictated by doctors. I didn't have any say, obviously, over it. 
Um, and I had this test called a neuropsych test, and my memory was about 30% of what it should have been. And so to be confronted with the fact that a third of my memory isn't there at the moment is something that was incredibly confronting, and it was pretty much, right, that's it. Like, I can't play footy anymore. And so the decision was kind of made for decision, you? The decision was very clear. And so from that point on, it was about managing what came next. I knew that I was incredibly lucky. I've got this path of my life that I can pick up and go and run with. Um, and so I did. Um, I started with one subject at uni and trying to deal with that and progressed to um, three in the next semester. And at the same time, um, I'd sort of been building up my ability to exercise properly. And so uh, the next sort of question became, you know, what, what sport could I get back into? It's such a large part of my life that's been taken away. Um, sort of had a, an opportunity to get into rowing, which is a very different sport for a kid growing up on a farm three hours north of Adelaide, <laughs> where there's not a lot of water and <laughs> a pretty random, pretty random sport to be inserted into. Um, and so I guess that was the point in time where I had something to work with that could offset the university studies that I was having. Um, and offset it, the sense of loss. Yeah, mm. definitely. And so I threw myself into it. And thank you very much for sharing mm. your story with us. Incredibly you. brave of you. I think there's something about this story that, like, even you were saying that identity, like having another identity other than sport is so important to help you um, have, like, you know, a, a purpose or, or just something else just to move into. Yeah, in the world, so yeah. that you don't, uh, so that you aren't left floundering. And, and you, you didn't, that. neither of you had that? No, well, and, and you had that with aeronautical engineering, and yet we can still see that there's something about sport that even if you are prepared for it, there's something about the loss of sport that can be just so devastating. Melanie, what advice did your dad give you? Um, many times as I grew up, I couldn't even tell you how many times, um, my dad always would say to me that um, my best was outside of the swimming pool. Mm. Um, and you know, my, there was never any expectation that I would go to university or anything like that, but it was something I always wanted to do. Um, as I said, I wanted to be a doctor for as long as I can remember and that was always my plan. And so for him to say that ongoing, constantly reminding me of that, I think just throughout my career, it really levelled me all the time, mm -hmm. um, which just allowed me to realise that all the time I was swimming, this was a part of my life that was going to end. Mm -hmm. And I was very well prepared for that mm -hmm. because of him, I think. Lauren, did you ever have a job? No, never. <laughs> and never did, even considered it. Did making a lot of money, you made a lot of money out of basketball. I mean, did that make it easier or harder, do you think, to deal with retirement? Oh, no, I, well, it gave me an option. Like, there were a lot of times during my career where all I wanted to do was get in a combi van and travel around Australia. Like, that's it. I just wanted to be away and do nothing. And, you know, obviously making money definitely... Um, gave me the opportunity to do that if I wanted to when I retired. So it, it gave me the option to either just sit down and do nothing or, you know, whatever mm. I wanted to do. So, but the thing is, I, I ended up taking up a job offer I got within a month of retiring because sitting at home was clearly mm -hmm. doing nothing for me and I was actually going crazy. Um, mm. And Barry, what about you? I mean, you had no job outside football? No job, no. Mm. Useless. Yeah. So, <laughs> so ill, well, ill prepared for retirement, do you think? Um, yeah, well, I'd, well, in the AFL, it's, it, it's actually, they're pretty good at preparing people for the aftermath in terms of financial and um, getting guys to study and all that sort of thing. And people used to tell me all the time, it's going to be over in a blink of an eye. And I used to roll my eyes and go, shut up, you so silly so. old bugger. <laughs> um, and now I'm saying the same thing to to young kids, so listen, please. Uh, no, I didn't listen, and um, as I said, I'm very lucky and fortunate that I was managed well, and that uh, I kept my profile ticking along because I'm not qualified at anything to earn money. So um, education, uh, I've got no qualifications. Um, so if I don't get endorsement deals, or do, what, what do I do? I've got no income. That's why you do tissue ads. Yeah. Well, I was. I was. <laughs> 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 Thanks for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, I, that's, that's one thing I've been very blessed and lucky with, 
that you know that that sort of stuff has, has popped up. But, so this um, is all about a profile, of course. It's yeah. about mm -hmm. it, and that's it, it's how high a profile you have and how desirable your profile is, or how interested people are in your kind of profile. Mm. I should yeah? say I've got nothing because I've, I I own some mechanical shops because my family are into mechanics and my brother runs all those. Yeah, in terms of me actually going and doing something or getting a job, there's probably not a lot I could do. Mackenzie, you, uh, you're a goalkeeper with the Western Sydney Wanderers Academy and you're hoping to play A-League. Yeah, you got a question? During your sporting career, uh, how did you balance your schooling with your sports commitment? I'm, um, I've been doing my undergrad for the last seven years, and I'm <laughs> only just in my second year. <laughs> the university recently sent me a letter saying, you do realise you have a ten-year time limit on your degree, and that you need to hurry up, so... I think the question, though, I think what Mackenzie wants to know is just how, when you're training and doing all that kind of thing, how do you balance school with... I guess the point was, like, it's, I'm doing it very, very, very part-time. Yeah. Um, high school, I had the option to do 11 and 12 over three years, um, I ended up getting impatient and actually doing it in the two years. But I guess our training sessions were structured around school. Um, so, you know, we would train 6 to 8.30 and then um, 3 to 6.30 to accommodate that. And I never ended up doing homework because of it, or seldom did homework, and just tried to get it all done in that six-hour period that I was at school. Lauren, what about you? When I, when I was your age, I... You're, I failed high school miserably. Like I missed uh, 100 days or something in year 11 and 90 in year 12 and I, I didn't even get my HSC. And then it wasn't until 2010 that I started studying um, at uni. But I, I think the difference for me was to, was learning how to study. Like for me, being in a classroom at your age wasn't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be playing basketball. I wanted to be training. That's all I could think about. And that's all I was good at. But times have changed, you know, and I think if you've got the opportunity to to play sport and do schooling, do it. Because when you get to our age, you're going to wish you did. Um, I certainly had tried to take my own life and I love my old man to death, but um, it just, I wouldn't expect him to call me in that moment. And I think um, it, it literally saved my life. My passion for sport came back. I started appreciating the things that I had achieved in my football career. I go to local footy clubs and train with the guys because I feel Part of something now. Whose responsibility is it to transition well? well it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Our special on athletes and retirement is going to continue next week. Stay tuned now for Dateline. I'm Jenny Brocky. Tonight on Inside, our special on athletes after retirement continues. <laughs> Lauren, you're regarded as one of the greatest women basketballers of all time. How did you react initially when you retired? Within five minutes I was bawling. I was crying. It felt like I was put out to pasture. What about you, Barry Hall? I chose to retire. Um, did I struggle after the sport finished? Absolutely. Yeah, we're big, tough, burly men who don't get depressed. Hang on, what are you talking about? I put on a lot of weight, um, had no routine, stopped all forms of exercise. I just put all of my eggs in one basket. Your promising AFL career with the Brisbane Lions was cut short last year with a serious concussion. In one second I was a footballer, loving it. Mm. Um, and that was where I wanted to be and the next second, bang, I was um, completely out. Suddenly I was plucked and shoved into a football environment where it was, holy moly, like this is what all the kids dream about. Whereas for me, I'd sort of grown up, I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. I'm studying to be a doctor, but for some reason I can't let go because that elusive gold medal never happened. Mel, you're an Olympic gold medalist as well. Did you have the laser focus? Probably not, to be honest. Many times as I grew up, my dad always would say to me that um, my best was outside of the swimming pool. 
What were you hoping to achieve as an AFL player? 100 games, AFL. Because to me, anything below that was a fail. And welcome to you all. Libby, you've hit that pool wall first so many times. Um, so many times she broke her wrist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here is one of your favourite wins, the 100 fly in Beijing. The, the first overwhelming feeling is relief. Yes. 100 percent relief because you're just so so thrilled that everything came together mm. because it's it's not just four years of training or however many years of training you've gone before you, but it's you have to have some luck on the day. Um, you have to make sure you nail your race process and to to touch the wall and win gold and achieve a dream that you've been thinking about for so long, um, you're just so relieved that it's there and you've done it. The relief has so all been worth it. Oh, it's so worth it. All, so the, worth all it. the stuff that you've put into it, that yeah. the, whole, the previous 10 years, all of the training, all of the sacrifices, sacrifices. it's all been worth it. <laughs> it's, like, it's actually been worth it, yeah. you know, all of that. What's the high like, though? Is there anything like it? Does anything compare to that feeling? Well, I mean, uh, one of my favourite things about racing was actually the moment before I got on the blocks. It's the anticipation of what's going to happen. So you, you don't know. You don't know how it's going to play out. And there's something so special about feeling so physically fit and so ready for a moment. Um, Is there anything like it? No. In the rest no, of there's life? Not. There's not. And I, you know, have got married and had a baby and, and you can't, you know, because so often, especially now having a, a little girl, people go, oh, you know, it must be, you go, how does it compare? And you can't compare it. No, underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Average. At, How at, would you okay. know? No, no, it's, it, you can't what about, compare it. You can't compare it. What, what about the rest of you? I mean, the highs. I don't really remember. Like, that high for me, I go into, I guess, a state of euphoria. And when we've won championships or uh, it could be anything that's happened that I've been on that real high, I don't actually remember that exact feeling that I felt and I mean I, I still I can't watch footage of it because I get so emotional watching it mm -hmm. it's really oh, bizarre really yeah so I don't uh, like it's I sort of stay away from it I don't like getting too emotional um, off the court so what were, I, you, what were you like on the court in those moments completely emotional it, um, adrenaline always took over when I got on court I was one of those athletes that I was always sort of scared off the court like I was always um Look, I'm Notice? a very aggressive basketball player, absolutely. <laughs> the minute I step on the court, I go for, I'll do anything to, you know, win. Um, off the court, I'd always, it took so much energy to get ready and I, it just got to the point where, like, I was scared I wasn't going to be good enough. Like, all the you time. Were I was you were scared you weren't going to be good yeah, enough. Yeah, always scared I wasn't going to be good enough. So that drove me to train more and everything. And it just, it's such a weird cycle that I'm still trying to figure out. Like, I don't know how I actually managed to do that for so many years. Mm -hmm. That's why it was funny listening to you talk about having a baby too. So when I had my son, that was the greatest moment of my life. Oh, and I wanted to make a yeah, point yeah, that yeah. it's... Because <laughs> I was like, this may come across as yeah. really no, terrible. No, no, like no, a no, terrible no, mother no, no, that this so. is better. But, but Lauren, just going back to that, it's really interesting because it sounds like the emotion of it was just massive for yeah, you just, all the time. Well, that's why where I struggled, like off the court, because I could never... like. I, I don't know how I actually did what I did on the court um, and then off the court the highs and the lows of being a professional athlete I just could not deal with and there was never any middle mm. ground with me there was just mm. up here or down here and I like it I don't miss that one little bit I never will miss that mm. what about you Barry were, were there highs for you like when you you know yeah. kicked a crucial goal or took a crucial mark I mean Absolutely. did you get exhilaration from that yeah we, we won a premiership at the Swans after a 72-year drought, so it was kind of a big deal. Um, I, I wanted to be a boxer, but I, in the background, always loved football, so I used to always sneak out the back paddock and kick the ball up and down, and I actually held up a block of wood as the Premiership Cup when I was a kid, and 
I got to do the real thing. Never thought I'd ever do it. But mm. um, it's, I, and I still get emotional now watching it. Same as, mm. same as Lauren and, and probably you guys. You, you get emotional still. I'd go to talk at a function and they'll put that up there and I'll be like, oh, hang on a second. you know what went into that moment. You know how yeah. much. Yeah. So is that a problem in retirement, replacing those moments Absolutely. or finding something that, that can compensate well, for that not does being compare. part of your life? No. You know, it, mm. it's, so, it's such an unreal mm. world mm. and an unreal moment that happens is, if yeah. you're lucky every four years. Mm. Mm. That's why so many athletes have come downs after the Olympics yeah. because well, yeah, the it's post Olympic like, blues. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, a it's, a, it's a really common phenomenon because of the intensity of the emotions, the adrenaline, the endorphins, mm. all of the stuff like that comes mm. with the Olympus. Stop, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> there um, you are. And then you are left with you know a crash afterwards mm. and nothing I mean, that's why I, you know, I, I brought up before, it's about, you know, do you choose to keep on chasing those highs? Because it can be quite an empty, unfulfilling... Mm. Um, well, and you know, that's why people spiral pursuit. into drugs and alcohol, because exactly. Be they don't know how to manage those... Drugs either, like, um, copy the high that you get from, you know, from the Olympics, or alcohol mm. numbs the feeling mm. that you get. And so it's no surprise that so many athletes um, or people in general do turn to those things because chemically it it, it, it replicates, replicates that same it. feeling that you get and you do get hooked on it. Like after the Olympics, you're like, oh my God, that was the best thing ever. Do you get those highs from anything now, Yana? I actually genuinely do have that high every time I deliver a baby, I guess, because I want to be an obstetrician, mm. gynae. Mm. And to be honest, every, like, I remember the, the day I decided not to do Rio was the day I didn't want to drive to training because I wanted to stay back for this surgery. And we were there for three or four hours. I missed the training, so I didn't tell my coach at the time um, and went home to see, to see my kids. And it was probably that day that I realised I was done. Exams for, my, for med for me are so hard and you're like on the borderline of failure every five minutes. So, and you get yelled at by doctors like they're coaches. So it's mm. like... For me, I'm, I've really found it's replaced. That mm. medicine has very much replaced the highs um, because there are it's life or death on many occasions mm. and you get to yeah. be a fly on the wall in those rooms. Has it replaced the highs for you? Um, probably not as much. Um, I think I, I probably never really chased the highs, to be honest. I was very intrinsically motivated. I was always one that just wanted to see how good I could be. Mm. And to be honest, I retired doing more than what I ever expected I was capable of. So I actually exceeded my potential in my own mind. Mm. Um, and I think that's a huge difference mm. because if, like for Yana, you it's know... It's a very good place to be. Yeah. It's a great actually. place to be. Mm. But, you know, for Yana, it, you know, that gold medal that she was always, always craving, been, yeah. that's, that's the gap that's missing, I guess. And, you know, if you... I don't, I don't know, because if you lower your expectations, you may never get there, which I didn't. So is that the difference? Had I raised my expectations, would I have got there? Maybe, I don't know. Mm. Matthew, that dive of yours, which was the highest scored dive in Olympic still is. history, <laughs> by the way, and still is, I, by the way, still competitive, still is, no, still is. I'm not no, an athlete anymore. I just have to, you know, like I do worry that like I'm fading into insignificance because Beijing was like eight years, nine years, nine ago. years ago. Yeah, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, but what I want to ask you about was what happened after that for you yeah. because you went and checked your rating didn't you oh, what yeah. how, so how soon after that dive was that it was maybe just within two weeks maybe after getting home um, I for some reason this thought in the back of my head came back up again um, you know like I want to be the best in the world and so I actually went onto the FINA diving website um, and had a look at the rankings that were from the whole year and I was actually ranked number two in the world because the Chinese diver who came th the second had actually won more events earlier in the year than I had. And so all of a sudden, in my mind, I'm still not the best in the world. Mm. I mean, which it did act as, um, as, a, as a very powerful motivator to keep going. But I you did, were still counting I where was, you were. Absolutely. Mm. I was still counting. Even after an Olympic gold medal, it was still, <laughs> um, it didn't satisfy all of the things that I thought it would satisfy in yeah. me. Jake, I want to ask you a little bit uh, more about your career because we heard how important it was for you to make an AFL team and to play 100 games. Uh, you were diagnosed with depression while you were playing for Carlton. What was going on for you during that time? Yes, yeah, so it was a pretty confronting period uh, for me. When I was 19, two years into my career, 
I started noticing some behavioural changes in myself. And I was always a confident kid at school, um, got along with everyone. And I started noticing things like just getting out of bed was really, really, really difficult. Um, I'd start just crying for no reason. Um, I'd, I'd find myself on my way to training. Uh, I was getting a lot of anxiety and a lot of, a lot of stress. And then I just kind of, you know, I'd have to man up in my mind. It was just like, you know, I'm supposed to be an AFL footballer. Um, it, w w why are you going through this and why are you thinking this way? Get over it, get the training, don't let anyone think that anything's wrong with you. So you were trying to push through it? Absolutely, yeah. I, I looked at football as like a, a drug. Um, it, it was my addiction mm -hmm. because when I was out on the field and I was playing, um, I, my life was perfect, it was great because I was doing something that I was, I was bloody good at. Mm, other, um, you were nodding about the idea of it being a drug, yeah. Libby? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think. Um, when you have that intensity of focus and drive for something, you know, you kind of, com like, it's a compulsion to go to training. It's a compulsion to try and achieve something. And, you know, that's definitely, I think, along the lines of, of an addiction. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, yep. yeah, and actually quit uh, and went back home to the farm. Um, and the club, you know, to their credit, Roddy Ashman, he was the welfare guy at the club at the time. And we sat around a table for the first time in, in that whole period going through everything, I had the opportunity to kind of talk about what I'd been going through. Um, and it was, a, it was a massive relief. Um, but for me... The now, idea... did you leave AFL at that stage? No, I didn't. I didn't want to leave AFL. I just wanted to get away from what was going on in here. Inside because, you. Yeah, because I was looking at my life going, here I am, I'm an AFL player. I'm living my dream. Um, I've got the best parents that I could possibly imagine. Two older brothers who were great role models. I just signed a contract for $180,000 a year as a 19, 20 year old. How good's life? Why am I feeling like this? This isn't normal, this isn't me. Um, so that scared the hell out of me. So the opportunity- And what happened, what happened after that? Because you were then delisted from yep. Carlton, yeah? Well, yeah, so Carlton offered me another contract um, as a, they, to almost like a demotion from senior list down to a rookie list. Uh, and I said, look, I already made my mind up that I was going to try and go somewhere else. And Western Bulldogs gave me the opportunity. That's where I met, met Barry there in the pre-season. And I think it, it was a fairy tale for me because my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my old man had all played at that football club. And I remember walking into those, that hallway when I first got there and my pops and dad's names up on the wall everywhere. And I'm thinking, how good is this? This is a fairy tale. I get the chance to reboot my career. Um, the depression went away. You know, I, had a, I had a verbal agreement that it was in place, um, but you know, come draft day, uh, I remember I was sitting having a coffee with my partner at the time and I, I just assumed that I was going to be picked up and drafted. Uh, but I got a phone call from my mum and it was like, you know, well, what's going on? I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, she said, well, your name hasn't been called out. And I just remember my whole world just come crushing in. What happened after that? That demon or that black dog just really uh, took control and I, I remember thinking what am I going to do now the rest of my life? Um, I was so set on becoming an AFL player um, that I, I didn't have anything behind me. And the only way that I could find a release uh, was to go out and party and drink. Mm. Uh, because when I was doing that, it, it replaced the sense of validation because I was partying and drinking. Everyone wanted to be around Jake Edwards, right? Mm. And, you know, all the girls and that would come up and want to be around me. All my mates want to be with me. And then that just kind of escalated into an environment that I was really um, addicted to. And, so yeah. addicted to drugs and alcohol? Yes, yeah, so alcohol was, was quite rapid. Uh, in 2011 was the first time I tried a narcotic. Uh, and that was after a premiership win win um, at 3 a.m. in the morning at the Crown Casino walking across. I just thought, you know what, everyone else is doing it. If I'm ever going to do it, now's the time. Um, what, 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 you know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, yeah, if I had known at that moment what I was going to do for the next three years of my life, um, it literally ripped, ripped me apart. And it what, did a, what did happen in Yeah, so it kind of led from a, something I thought I was in control of. Uh, to where, you know, nearly four years down the track, I was using probably every, or every day. At the end of that four years, I, I had, a, had an episode where a few things had triggered in my life. Um, you know, I was failing in, in business. Uh, financially, I was, I was on my knees. Um, I had, at one point, I had 45 cents in my account. I remember trying to sell um, a flat screen TV and Xbox games in the cash converters. 
just to get some money to actually go out to my best mate's birthday party that night. They wouldn't take this flat screen TV because it had a crack in the corner. And I remember walking out on the street and sitting in my car and just thinking, how has this happened? Like, I'm supposed to, I was this AFL player, you know, family's there, everyone's there, but here I am sitting in my ute on Puckle Street in Rooney Ponds in Victoria, you know, crying hysterically. And I sat there for about an hour. Um, and it all just, the realisation of where things had got was, was quite gone in the way of how do I get out of this now. Um, a few months down the track, uh, a girl from me at the time, what, she, she walked out of my life. Uh, and that was a triggering point. Where I'm, it was a Thursday night and I made a decision that, well, you know, this is it. You know, this thing you call life, um, I, I suck at it because I'm clearly failing in every area of my life. Uh, and I just kind of made a decision that I just don't want to do this anymore. And I went out partying uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, about four hours sleep, you know, alcohol fueled and, and drug induced. Uh, yeah, and I tried to take my own life uh, in my bathroom on a Monday morning. Um, I remember last, as the moment I was on the floor, um, my phone called. Um, and of all people in my life, you know, who checked my phone book, the last one I'd expect to call would be my dad. Um, just because growing up, you know, he was very hard and fair, and I love my old man to death, but um, it just I wouldn't expect him to call me in that moment. And I think um, it, it literally saved my life. Why do you think it got so hard for you? Because, you know, we watch public figures, sports people, you know, in these situations where they're, yep. they're in real trouble. Why do you think it got so hard for you, Jake? Yeah, well, I like to think that, like, you've got these great athletes up here. Um, you know, everyone, these guys here sitting next to me. I know Barry looks like Superman, but, you know, probably underneath his shirt there, he certainly doesn't have a big S on his chest. Um, and the fact is, is that we're not... We are human and we, we are people. Uh, and the frustrating thing I get from the community is that naivety for people like, I know Buddy Franklin's been through some stuff, you know, Mitch Clark, Ben Cousins of recent times. Um, you know, we, we've, we live in the communities that everyone else around us lives. So the challenges and issues that we face. You are the face, community as we well are, as yeah, so, and we are, sports We stuff. face the same challenges. Um, I guess for me it was such a level of expectation uh, growing up um, having failed in my eyes that I didn't achieve... You didn't get to that 100 games that you yeah. set as the goal that you wanted to get to. That's right, yeah, and I used that um, you know, as a mechanism, I guess, moving forward as to um, everything else in my life couldn't possibly reach that mm. potential anymore. Can you gauge how much of what happened to you you could attribute to a sports career and being an elite athlete and how much of it might have happened anyway? Yeah, I think, um, I think the fact how it kind of happened at the age of 19 and the fact that it kind of come, really crept up on me out of nowhere, I don't blame my mental health or depression for my football career. Mm. There's aspects of my career looking back I know that I didn't do well enough, um, but indirectly or directly, whether I like to admit it or not, um, my diagnosis and what I was going through, sy symptomatic, was affecting me as a, as a young man and that was going to directly infect, affect my performance as, a, as an athlete. Uh, and that's something I couldn't come to terms with. I couldn't possibly sit... But what about the pressures that being an athlete put on that young man as well? Yeah, extreme. The young man you were. Yes, I get asked that a lot in terms of the pressure cooker. I mean, you know, in terms of sitting in that environment. The football in my life didn't leave me when I left the club rooms. Like I wasn't a top 20 draft pick. So I'm committed to becoming an AFL footballer. Nothing else exists outside of that. So I was on the cusp the whole time. So I didn't know if I was going to get picked. I didn't know if I was going to be playing in the reserves, reserves that week. You know, and I brought that home and it affected my relationships. It affected my family life. It affected a lot of things that were going on outside of football. So looking at, a, at a, another teammate in the eyes uh, and having... The, I guess the environment where that conversation might happen, mm -hmm. where they say, mate, are you all right? Is everything okay? That scared me more than anything. Mm -hmm. I'd rather go around the footy field and get back into a pack with him running out full forward mm -hmm. and get smashed <laughs> rather than actually having a conversation with one of my teammates because I, I didn't want them to think that I wasn't mentally strong enough mm -hmm. to be a footballer because I knew physically I was fine, mm -hmm. but mentally I knew that I wasn't coping 
And that scared me because I didn't want to be seen to be weak. My passion for sport came back. So what it was, I started appreciating the things that I had achieved in my football career. I go to local footy clubs and train with the guys because I feel part of something now. Barry, you talked about your depression before, after leaving AFL. How did you deal with that? How did you come back from it? Well, I just set little goals for myself because there was nothing that I could do that was competitive for me anymore and tick that box. I, I loved being competitive and, and competing against people. I, I couldn't do that anymore. So that was a real issue for me. Um, and I didn't even realise that I was depressed or, you know, I couldn't talk to anyone. I wasn't talking to anyone because I wasn't answering my phone. I was just doing stuff that I wasn't, wasn't me at all. So it was probably three months, I reckon, where the penny dropped for some reason. I don't know what it was. I was like, this is ridiculous. What, you know, I slept in till 10, 10.30. It's not me. I'm usually up and at it. I'm energetic. I'm, you know, a go-getter. So I just set a task for myself. At 8 o'clock every morning, I'm up, and I've got to be at the gym by 8 o'clock. I try and push myself for PBs in the gym. I go to local footy clubs and train with the guys because I feel part of something now and I can teach them something and it makes me feel good about myself. Um, what about all that aggression? Where, where did you put that? Where have um, you put that? I do some boxing now, so... The boxing you hated? <laughs> <laughs> the boxing you hated? Yeah, I hate it, but I, I enjoy it now because it's a competitive thing that I can do. And uh, I hated it being a kid because it was hard and tough and um, I wasn't mentally attuned to, to be like that at that stage. And you weren't choosing it? Yeah, I wasn't yeah. choosing it, so... Now that I can do it, um, it's a competitive thing I can tick off again. It, it really challenges me Are still. Are you good at it? It's nice well, to feel well, good at something. Well, look at my nose, something. I'm not that good. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, how did you climb out of the trouble you were in? The turning point for me uh, was I had to sit there in front of my psychologist that I'd worked with during my AFL career and listen to her, put my mum on loudspeaker and say, um, look, I'm with Jake, as you know, he's, he's here with me and... Before he comes home on the farm, you make sure I need to make sure that there's no guns available that he can get access to and, and self-harm. Um, and I, even till this very moment tonight, when I go home to the hotel and put my head on the pillow, it's a it's a lump in the throat that I can hear mum every single night. Now, if I didn't have any bigger motivation to get some help and to get some serious change, um, that that was in that moment. So. I had to go spend time uh, in, in rehab and, and spend time working with a psychiatrist uh, and learning about mental health, mm. learning about depression, what is it. I'm not cured from depression. It's going to be with me forever. Uh, but what I've learned is that, and I still have crappy mornings. Yesterday, I was in a really crappy way. Uh, and my girlfriend would attest for that. <laughs> um, and I think it's important that over time, I, what I've learned is strategies and techniques to implement into my life. Um, you know, I love my music. Uh, I go to the beach, spend time in the beach. To, I think it's really critical to spend time by yourself uh, and learn about what you're going through, becoming self-aware. Uh, these are the things that I've learned over time uh, that are really important to me, that keep me, uh, keep me in check. Mm. But certainly doesn't cure me. I mean, mental health is one of those things. It's not... Um, it, you can always be happier. Like, you don't have to wait until you get to the absolute worst to actually finally, you know, do something about it as an absolute last resort, mm. um, like I did, <laughs> like you did. Um, like, you could be a happy person, but you could always be a little bit more resilient or a bit more happy or a bit more, you know... Yeah. Um, it, yeah. probably it's a good message for the yeah. younger people in Absolutely. the audience it to probably, be the, the greatest thing my psychiatrist taught me um, is that I think, as an athlete, we've got something greater set up uh, underlying than, than, than the normal average individual and that is that we do have commitment and dedication and we make stuff happen mm. really fast and we want to be the best in that field so what I was doing was I was focusing on clearly unresourceful things such as drinking and drugs and fueling that that um, anxiety and, and levels of depression so once I got my mindset into okay finding that purpose who I am what I want to do the rest of my life um, once I realized what that was it, the commitment and dedication, it just came natural. PJ, um, after you were forced to retire from the Broncos because of injury, how did you get yourself back together again? I think there was a number of things. It wasn't just one thing. I know that there's always that saying, and a lot of people would say, oh, there's a lot of other people out there that have got it worse than you. And I just figure to myself, that just makes me feel worse. Mm. Someone else out there feels worse than I do, and I feel like this. 
So I was like, well, that's just silly. And then other people were saying, I understand what you're going through. And I just felt that that was disrespectful to say that they understand. They're not me. They don't know. So I found that thing that I really enjoyed doing. And I was probably doing it without even knowing. And, and what that was, was that? working with young people. Mm. I had somebody that really supported me at a young age because I didn't get that scholarship straight from school. So I had, had a lot of sort of failure. I felt as though I'd failed before I'd even started as a 16-year-old. I never finished school to get that scholarship or anything. And I, I had to work for a year. Not that it was a bad thing. I look back at it now. It's great that I had to do that. So I, and I went the long route uh, around to getting to the Parramatta Reels at that stage. But there was a number of different things that happened. It was going away for two weeks and coming back home and my wife had signed my oldest boy up to play football. And I was like, I don't want him to play. I'd, I'd already enrolled him in tennis, in golf. I had him doing swimming, everything but football because I was dark on football. I didn't, I, mm. I was angry. But how did you get yourself back into gear? Was I, it working yeah. with the young people? What, what was it that, that I, kicked yeah. you out of where you were? It, it definitely was starting to work with young people and understanding that the young people I work with want to do what I've done and that's play State of Origin one day, play in the NRL and to see their eyes light up when I tell them a story and, as I said, to see my young fellow get excited about playing for sport again. So my passion for sport came back. So what it was, I started appreciating the things that I had achieved in my football career. Mm, rather than rather looking than what at what had you taken lost. From me. Yeah, yeah. Because I still miss football. To this day, I'm very much like the guys. You start talking about sport and you watch it. Grand final time, it's hard to watch sport. It's hard to watch football because... I'm wanting to do it, so I work in for Headspace. You know, it's a youth organisation deals with mental health. Mm. So I'm talking with young people every single day that come in with anxiety and mental health issues. And so are you, Jay? Yeah. So I was asked a question. My psychiatrist, Jake, what do you want to do the rest of your life? And I'm like, man, I'm worried about not having a beer. And you're asking what I want to do the rest of my life. That's a big <laughs> question, right? Um, I sat there with my mentor. Um, and I got talking to him about this idea I had about creating this organisation that can go back to community sport and I sat there for 45 minutes and literally he didn't say one word. He finished his latte, he looked at me straight in the eyes and he goes, Jake, don't wait for change, be the change. Mm. And then he just got up and paid for his coffee and walked off. That's all he said for 40 minutes. So what are you doing? <laughs> so I'm running an organisation now called Outside the Locker Room, uh, which works with local sporting clubs across Australia, uh, working in the welfare and education um, space, so supporting yeah, young adults and, and parents as well uh, with transitioning, it's basically finding that conduit to get them to uh, clinical support in their, in their regions, drugs, alcohol, mental health, all those type of issues. Libby, how did you get out of the slump after retirement? Um, the first time or the second time? The first time Last was going time. back into swimming. <laughs> um, the second time, um, because I was... I think because I had had that experience the first time around, I think that did prepare me a lot better. I kind of knew what to expect and I knew um, my mental health plan that, you know, you really do need to, to take consideration of it, I think, in your life. And so for me, that was exercise. I need to exercise every day um, because I think that obviously allows my chemicals to balance and you get that wonderful rush of endorphins you feel like you're working towards something yeah. um, it, that creates a, a, a balance in my life in my mental health um, and uh, talking to people so I see a, a psychologist regularly she's the lady who I was seeing when I was swimming so she knows me as an athlete but now she knows me um, as I've transitioned as well and I think when you find those people that you can engage with, that you trust um, and are separate from, you know, family and friends as well, I think that's really important mm. um, part of that um, transition period. Mm. How much do you miss the adulation? Heaps. <laughs> <laughs> do you? See, I'm yeah. the opposite. I never did it for the adulation. Oh, no. Um, it was all about validation yeah. for me. Um, and so I guess it's no surprise that I ended up, like, veering off into, into a career theater. into theatre. <laughs> in cabaret. In, in, yeah, into theatre where, um, you know, it's like it's all about the applause. Um. Let's have a look at you.
Interesting combination there. Mm. You can sing, yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know what? I it's all it's been all about the training, honestly. Like um, for the. But is this about still wanting to be in the limelight? Uh, I th I think it is actually, um, and so it's been a real exercise for me to um, let go of that perfectionism um, because you have to let go of a lot of the control. I mean, I th I find music very therapeutic, um, and I've used. The cabaret as a vehicle for me to tell my story about um, my struggles with mental health problems in the past, um, my addiction to crystal meth, and my recovery from that. Over the the year and a half that I've been retired, like the reason why I retired was because I thought, you know, I'd just done Dancing with the Stars, and then I'd just done Sunrise Weather, and so I thought, yep, that's it. I'm going to be on TV. Like, you know, this is it. And so I. I quit in order to um, be as available for all of these jobs that were definitely <laughs> about to come in, um, and they didn't. And you know, and the novelty of not being an athlete was great for a while. And I watched a whole lot of TV um, in bed with peanut butter. But then the novelty wore off, <laughs> and it didn't become a choice anymore because I didn't have anything to go into. Mm -hmm. And I just got so exasperated waiting for all of these. Of waiting for the phone to ring, which it didn't, and then so because of that. So you you had this sense of expectation and almost entitlement. Entitlement, totally. Mm. I had this sense of entitlement because I've seen other athletes just you know, you walk into you know TV jobs. I thought you know well, what's something? I have no skills. Um, TV seems like a great thing for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's that Whoa. easy. Isn't it? Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> So now I'm studying um, writing and, and trying to do some journalism subjects um, to hopefully be more employable. What about you, Lauren? Tell us how you got out of your slump after retirement. Um, I, I don't know. I, well, I, I, I fell pregnant. <laughs> so I had to. You know, I didn't really have any other option. I had, and then I also got a job offer that I took up. And um, I think emotionally... I, f I figured out that I needed to be in safe spaces, um, you know, with my family and, you know, my friends who I consider family, obviously. But um, just, you know, staying even as well, like not trying to get too high, not getting too low, you know, and that's been something that I've you know, struggled with throughout my career. And so, but that is the one thing that's actually helped me and that works for me. So until I had my child, I, um, I, had been even, but the highest moment in my life was those 24 hours after I had him. And I've never ever felt like that in my life. So I know I can feel that way again, which is fantastic. I just have to have another kid. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But that's obviously been a very big thing in terms Huge. of just coping with the, the change. Well, you know, as an athlete, um, and anyone in this room can tell you, you focus so heavily on yourself. You know, and for my whole career, I've focused on my I've been the most selfish human being in the whole entire world um, it was funny because right before um, I, I had him I, I remember thinking oh my god this is like I just went into a complete breakdown I, I melted down and I thought how am I really gonna love this kid is is this the right thing like what am I gonna do how am I gonna deal with this and it just changes and I think that oh, like it's frightening how amazing this is you know for me so like it's a little bit scary because I am still on that high but yeah. Mm. What about you, Mel? Having kids? It does. It does give me new purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me as well, it was a natural progression. I finished my swimming career. I always wanted a family. Um, and so it was a natural progression. And same as Lauren, like, the moment you hold your child for the first time, there is nothing comparable to that. Um, and it's very different to winning an Olympic gold medal. But for me, it was better. Libby, it, it wasn't so easy for you to start with, was it? No, no. Um, I, I mean, yes, I had that rush of emotion when you when you first hold your baby, um, but I, I didn't find the transition into motherhood very easy at all. I found it incredibly difficult, probably because I was incredibly selfish as an athlete and very self-centered, always focused on what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve. Um, in the world and then all of a sudden you have this overwhelming 
sense of responsibility for this tiny little being that is completely dependent on you. And I, I hated that. I was scared because I didn't think I could give enough to this baby. I, I didn't think I was going to be enough for her. You know, it's taken a long time and a lot of um, counselling and a wonderful GP who helped me through that to, you realise that whatever baby you get is it's so individual. Mm -hmm. You never know what you're going to get and you just have to love the baby, your child, for what they are and know that you are doing your absolute best. Mm -hmm. yeah. Barry, you're about to become a father. When's the baby due? This is all just spooking me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous, honestly. <laughs> uh, seven weeks. We'll be at 40 weeks, so uh, around about seven weeks. But um, What do you think you'll be like? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a lot of my doings in life and sport and what's made me successful and try and pass it on to my child in terms of values and hard work and invest in yourself and all those sorts of things. Uh, being punctual and all the stuff you do in sport, I'll definitely push onto my child because they're good values. They're really good values. Um, but I certainly won't be a pushy parent. Um, Around boxing? You're playing AFL or boxing or whatever it may be. Um, I certainly won't be that. I still feel totally unemployable. Whose responsibility is it to transition well? To what extent is it your responsibility individually to do that? <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> what would have helped you with the transition to retirement, to getting out of elite sport? I think these conversations mm. is a really good starting point. Um, I think in the long run we need to create programs or workshops, um, something to educate athletes further. It's, it's hard because, uh, you know, having thought about that question a bit of what would have helped me, I don't know that if someone came to me with a workshop or a counselling program at, you know, 20 years of age that I would have listened. Because at that time, you know, you're six foot tall and bulletproof and you're like, well, that's so far down the track for me that I can't actually process that. But Mel, you felt that you didn't get support when you finished? Uh, to an extent, yeah. Um, I mean, I was fortunate enough that I probably didn't need it. But I think the fact is that there were athletes who retired at the same time as me who did need it. Mm. Um, and at the moment, the, the current strategy is um, offer support through emails or maybe a phone call. And that's it. Mm. That's the end of the conversation. And so how many athletes are actually going to take that up when it doesn't really feel like it's legitimate anyway it's really a tick in the box you know I think the the letter that I received started with so you didn't make the Olympic team <laughs> and it's like well oh that's lovely okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, so you know it really does feel like a tick in the box in the moment and I I do actually think that's largely to do with resources mm. Lana you're from happening. Swimming Australia your response to that I mean what do, what does Swimming Australia do to support athletes afterwards yeah we're building our program mm. at the moment so um, under the Australian Institute of Sports Personal Excellence National Framework, we have transition program for the retirement phase. But we're very aware that it's a five to ten year prospect to mm. build these programs into what you know we need them to be. Mm. Um, so and valuable. Do you think you need a program that starts when athletes are junior level, like even at that very early stage, starting to prepare them for life after school mm. and then life after sport? Absolutely. At those key progression events, we can intervene throughout the whole pathway, mm. not just at the end. That's awesome. I do think that's a really valuable strategy. Mm. I think it's really important to acknowledge codes that are doing it well. Um, and I feel as though the AFL is actually going quite about it in quite a decent manner, probably driven by the fact that there's a players association. Mm. It was impressed on us right from the word go that you needed to have something going on, whether it was university or TAFE or an apprenticeship or something that was happening outside of football. And I think that that's something that should be acknowledged and should be maybe a blueprint. Marissa, you're, um, you work with the AFL Players Association on player development. What does the AFL provide to players leaving the game when they retire? Yeah, yeah. So, it's really pleasing to hear Justin's feedback around that. And we've done a bit of work with Justin and, and clearly 
will continue to support him as we do all of our players. But probably the piece that, that's really important from our end is that transition doesn't start at the point of transition. Mm -hmm. um, we work with our players at really, um, and the industry really as a whole, at talking to a philosophy of pure individualisation when the players are in the game. So we work with clubs to develop action plans for players whilst they're in the game for their off-field development. That is that alongside. voluntary or is it compulsory? Yeah, we, we don't make any of our programs compulsory. We uh, <laughs> sort of understand that if you force any people to, to go on a certain path that, that doesn't appeal to them at any given time, the so results So how many people actually use it, access it? We had about 30% of our players, all players on, on, on the 18 AFL club lists, that identified it as having some kind of plan around their off-field development. Um, the second year after we implemented Max360, that, that number went up to 53%. And the third year, which was last year, that was at 66%. So we see that really gradual increase. That tells us that right now we've got about two-thirds of our playing group who have some kind of a written plan that they're working with uh, their, their own support network within the club, within the AFLPA, to, towards their goals and their targets. But, but the other piece that I, that I want to raise here too is there's a really important structural part to this. And um, we talk about programs and workshops. So for, for where we sit, this is much more about the way play development is embedded in the life of a yeah. football club embedded in the industry and therefore the career of, of these guys and, and now girls in our case. Um, and the understanding that a really well-balanced, happy, in growing, developing individual is actually going to perform better in their workplace and also be happier and, and able to transition, hopefully, um, much more smoothly. Barry, would you have accessed any of that? I wouldn't have at that stage, but I think football clubs and the AFLPA have come a hell of a long way since... Um, you know, since I retired, and that's only, what, six years ago. Um, I think you've got to create an environment where players are comfortable to talk, mm -hmm. and I think that's a lot better now. Mm -hmm. I, I was still in that muncho, you know, I'm too tough to be depressed stage, and a lot of players were, and I wasn't comfortable with talking to anyone about it. Paul, you're um, head of the NRL's Wellbeing and Education Unit. You run mandatory programs, don't you? Mandatory wellbeing programs. How, how are they working? With your players, well, we, we well with our under 20s competition, we make it mandatory. You have to work or study, so you have to do something. Um, we don't. We try and try and steer in anyone in direction, but it's just something else that gives you some value in your life, uh, and a purpose and self-esteem and self-concept in your life. Whose responsibility is it to transition well? To what extent is it your responsibility individually to do that? Well, it's I very just, uncomfortable. Yeah, I think, I think ultimately it always comes back to, to you, you yeah. the individual, and I think as athletes we all know that, you know, it, it all, our performance always came down to us. But we don't know unless we know. And so exactly. now that there's, like, now that a conversation has started and, and now that we're saying it is the athlete's responsibility... Mm. But to, you need that support network. That's, well, yeah, the facilities need... The infrastructure needs to be there in order for you to take responsibility mm. for mm. your Because own. you're used to having structure yeah. it, it will around you. To take so I guess... My my question is, you know, how do you move into a situation where you have to start taking the responsibility? There isn't somebody demanding you be at training every day. Mm. You've got to actually do something to change your life. Um, you know, to what extent is it the obligation, or do you see it as the obligation of these sporting bodies to do something, and to what extent do you think it's your responsibility well? As well? I, I think that we need to create that culture so that, you know, from the guys who are coming through now, 16, 17, 18, that they just know now what they're working towards outside of their sport. For us who have already retired and, you know, we're sort of trying to make background, you know, we have to, we do have to take responsibility for our, our transition and, but it would be um, helpful if the, the organisations that we were performing for um, and competing for help us through that. You know, you don't devote so much of your life to, um, to your sport um, and you would hope that they would return the favour um, and help you make that transition a little bit easier as well. But also keep your athletes engaged in the sport, you know, because they, we are role models whether we like it or not and, you know, there are so many athletes coming through who watched you and watched you compete and you can give back to the sport and I know that is something that I so value now is still being engaged with swimming and, and you know, promoting swimming and, and making sure that people know what a wonderful sport it is. That gives me value um, and validation and, you know, hopefully helps the the transition as well, I think. Yeah, you don't you... want people, I, I say, I don't want people to watch this show and think, oh, poor athletes, oh, he had a great 150 games, 
every kid would have loved to have done what he done. What's he whinging about? I blame nobody. I know that I needed to prepare better, and it was just probably, you know, I probably didn't have things in place, and it was my fault, you know. And I, and that's why now I do what I do, going out, talking to young people, and just making them aware of it. I want them to focus on their plan A, but just be mindful that plan B, you may and you probably will need it one day. Mm. Do you still miss it? Every day. Yep. <laughs> Every day. Every day. Mm. Barry, you're a commentator now. You're a part-time coach with the uh, Gold Coast Suns. Do you still get the urge to be out there? Yeah, just before games when they're warming up and you get that feeling of when you used to, to run out and what that felt like and the adrenaline. I, I do miss it. Uh, I don't miss the the day-to-day -day yeah. during a week stuff. Don't miss the training. <laughs> <laughs> don't but miss the you, you, miss, you miss the game day. Yeah, yeah. the adrenaline. <laughs> Lauren, you're um, the commercial operations manager at the Boomers, the Melbourne Boomers. How's that going? Oh, I love it. I, um, I've really enjoyed becoming an administrator and being behind the scenes. I, you know, I, I love it. Do I've, you miss I'm, being out there? I don't miss the pain. I don't miss... <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't miss. Um, no, not yet. I will at some point, I think, but I don't right now. There was just too much I went through. Mm. Mm. What about the rest of you, Jay? Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, I left AFL, went home the country, played a year, went back to VFL, to semi-professional, and then went back to country for four years, and now I've gone back to semi-professional in the VFL. Um, I miss that real competitiveness, but also miss that high level of training um, and that camaraderie all moving together in the one direction to achieve the, the ultimate outcome. Uh, so, Peter? yeah, yes and no. Do you miss it still? Yeah, I was one. I said every day. I miss it every day. I, I suppose I, I go to junior sports now and I watch my boys play and I'm actually not allowed to say anything on the sideline. <laughs> my wife tells me I've got to stand a certain distance back. But I, I watch and I see the enjoyment that they get out of it as I did as a kid and it's, it is fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Libby, what are you doing now? Uh, I'm on a, a radio show in, um, based out of South East Queensland in Brisbane. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's fun. Um, live radio is kind of a little bit adrenaline pumping, so you kind of get that little payoff that I probably... Performing. Would. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You are performing, um, definitely. So that's a lot of fun. And obviously my daughter keeps me on my toes mm -hmm. a lot. As and well. do you miss swimming? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, it's becoming less and less. How are you managing now, Matthew? Um, oh, I still feel totally unemployable. Um, SBS, if you're watching, like, I'm <laughs> hey. totally free. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, like, <laughs> I'm always looking for, honestly, I'm always looking for work. I want to work in the media entertainment business. And um, until, you know, like a radio or a TV job comes along, I feel like the cabaret is something that is good to tide me over because it's something that I can control in my own time. Mel, how are you going? Yeah, busy. Um, just taking it day by day, sometimes hour by hour. But um, look, I'm on a pathway towards a goal that I have wanted to, to reach my whole life. To be a doctor. So I've really just, I guess, replaced one addiction with another. So um, eventually becoming a doctor, that's the end goal. And um, yeah, that's where I'm headed. And Justin, what about you? How are you managing? Yeah. Where um, are you up to with your degree? Yeah, so I'm two and a half years into my mech and aerospace degree. Um, and hopefully, you know, I should finish it, no worries at all. Obviously, I miss the game terribly. Um, and would love to be able to play, not necessarily at the AFL level, but be able to go back home into the country and play against, well, with my mates again. But I know that I'm never going to be able to get that. So that's probably the next step that I also miss as well. Um, but in terms of life goals, I guess that railroad has ended and I'm back onto the other one again and I've just got to take that and go forwards with it. Mm. Thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us. It's been really good talking to you and really appreciate you sharing so much with us. And that is all we have time for here, but let's keep talking on Twitter and Facebook. This is where everything began. This is what moulded me to become the monster that I once was. It all began from a very, very young age, you know, that, that life of just taking and, and not giving a damn about what the consequences were. You're stealing money from the milkman, next minute you're jumping counters and robbing tills. You're kicking indoors and taking people's drug money. That's 
That's how it began. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned now for Dateline. Thanks, everybody.